So we have a new number one phrase in our language over the past year or so. It's even appeared on t-shirts. You're on mute. Most of us wouldn't have had a clue what that meant 18 months ago. Now it's the most popular phrase around, knocking the long time holder of the top spot off its perch. The former number one? I'm fine. You're on mute is a statement of fact. I'm fine has a somewhat ambivalent relationship to the truth. It's what we feel we should say because in polite society, there's not really much room for struggle. And even more sadly, it's often assumed that in Christian circles, there is less room for struggle. After all, aren't we supposed to trust the Lord in all circumstances? Aren't we supposed to experience peace that passes all understanding? Aren't we supposed to have faith and know that God is enough? Isn't raw honesty really a sign of failing trust? Real believers are fine, aren't they? It's what marks them out as real believers. So best to fall in line. I'm fine. Well, what a load of nonsense. Even a cursory read through of the Psalms reveals not just songs of joy and examples of humble dependence, but the kind of raw honesty and about hurt and pain and questions and struggle that frankly make us wince at times. Lines that we might prefer to have been edited out. And Psalm 137 is one such example. It is not a comfortable read in many ways, but I think that's good. It challenges those of us who prefer someone to always answer, I'm fine, to wake up to the reality of what others might be experiencing. And for those of us who inwardly despair as we parrot that line again, I'm fine, here is God's word engaging with the depths of emotion and experience that we can feel. Let's listen to the first half of our psalm, Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Now, I suspect that for many of us listening to those opening lines, all we can actually hear is Boney M's 1970 discos hit, which might feel like a guilty pleasure to listen to, but runs the risk, we think, of trivialising the tone of this song. But actually, if you listen to the lyrics of their song properly, they were closer to the true feel of the psalm than you might think. I might hear only a jaunty disco beat, but the lyrics actually are all about the longing for freedom. Longing sung by a black group of the ongoing battle against racism and oppression, and of the pain and injustice that accompanies it. See, I might be genuinely able to say I'm fine, but others are not. And if you read Psalm 137 with any degree of care, then in these opening verses you can hear the pain that is expressed. Now, it's possible that the psalm was written after the return from exile, hence the use of a past tense. But clearly the writer was there and experienced firsthand the sadness and despair that came with it. God's people are thousands of miles from home in exile in Babylon. They have been forcibly removed from homes and loved ones, from their land of promise, from the temple where God dwelt among them. A temple that was torn down as the city itself was sacked and destroyed. And now they sit in captivity. Their harps put to one side because singing is an expression of joy and there is no joy. And what's worse, they're surrounded by their captors mocking them with requests for the old songs. Entertain us. Sing us a happy song like you used to. Make us smile. And the people of God sit and they weep. It is a bitter scene. They are far from where they should be, far from where they long to be. Everything is wrong. The New Testament uses the language of exile to describe our experience now as God's people. As yet far from home, far from the place we long to be, God's place with him. Experiencing the dislocation that comes with that, painfully aware that things are not what they should be. Our bodies don't quite work right. Our relationships can be a struggle. 
Our battle with sin is wearying and endless. And as we fight on all these fronts, there are times when all we can do is sit and weep, longing to be home. And I'm fine is the biggest lie told. See, God's word echoes not simply the thoughts, but the feelings, the struggles, the agonies of a people in exile, a people who long to be home. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? How can we sing songs of joy from a place of exile, from this place that is so clearly not God's place? Well, because God's place is no less real, though we are not yet there. So in verses 5 and 6, the psalmist looks again to the distant horizon and he knows that Jerusalem is there, that Jerusalem must not be forgotten. Not simply Jerusalem, the city with broken down walls and ruined temple, but Jerusalem, Zion, God's city, symbolizing the wonder and certainty of God's promises to his people. The never giving up love of God towards his people. The never giving up love of God, which came through the prophets, even as they predicted this exile. That the story was not over and would never be over until he had finally taken them home. Because the Old Testament was always pointing forwards to a greater city, a greater land. Just as it pointed forwards towards a greater prophet, a greater priest, a greater king. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? Well, because they are the songs of the Lord, the covenantal God, the promise-making, promise-keeping God. Exile is not forever. He has promised to take us home. And in the midst of the bitterness of our experience of the brokenness of this world, there is always reason for joy. Because God's people who sit by the rivers in Babylon may weep real tears, but they are not to be in despair. Because their God has promised to take them home one day. And nothing can or will prevent or deter him from keeping that promise. Theirs is a sure and certain hope amidst the tears by the rivers of Babylon. But our psalm is not finished yet. And the rawness of the language actually has barely begun. We pick it up at verse 7. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried, tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them across the rocks. Well, there's a section we think should never have made it past the spin doctor's edit. How do you smooth that over? Well, first of all, I don't think we're supposed to smooth it over. What you hear here is raw honesty, genuine anger at what Israel has suffered, unfiltered emotion. It is the very opposite of I'm fine. There's nothing sanitized about the language of the Psalms. Secondly, this is not some carefully crafted reflection piece written from a position of comfort which lashes out in extreme ways. No, think back again to the feel and the context of the Psalm as a whole. This is written from the experience of exile, real physical exile with all that that meant. The uprooting of from home and family, oppression and mockery from captors. An uprooting that was violent, involving the destruction of the city, the murder and rape of friends and family. See, Jerusalem's population was not gently escorted off into exile. No, the invading Babylonian armies were notoriously brutal, cruel and violent. The sacking of a city such as Jerusalem suffered was an unimaginable, hideous experience. That's when children were seized and smashed against rocks in front of their mothers, before the mothers were raped in front of the fathers. That's what Babylon did. So what does Babylon deserve for such terrible atrocities? Not just to Judah, but to many other nations. Imagine for a moment, if it were possible, that you were on the receiving end of all that. What does Babylon deserve? See, verse 7 puts us in the scene of a law court, an appeal for justice to the Lord. Remember what has been done to us. 
Edom, who egged it all on and took delight in our suffering, and Babylon, the arch destroyer and defiler of all that is good and right, who raped our women, murdered our men, butchered our children. Bring justice. May they be repaid to, according to what they have done. That's the essence of the shocking language in verse 9. It's not about the senseless killing of children. It's about Babylon, the nation, experiencing what she deserves. Punishment in keeping with her crimes against humanity. So the reality is that most of us have not suffered greatly at the hands of others so that we can understand the language used here. And for that, we should be thankful. But we see a glimpse of it, perhaps, in the the agony of an anger of a mother and father on the steps of a law court after the conviction of the killer of their daughter, who demand retribution, who have only harsh words for the convicted man, justice, punishment for evil done, because evil must not go unpunished. So then, as New Testament believers, what are we to do with this conclusion to Psalm 137? Well, there's much to say, but two things very briefly as we close. Firstly, we recognize again that judgment is real and that the desire for justice is a good one. But with that comes the challenge here to surrender that justice to God to deliver and not to take it into our own hands. That's exactly what this psalm does. Remember, Lord. And that will be hard. Paul captures that challenge in Romans 12, verses 17 to 21, when he says this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, that's not a watering down of the sentiment of Psalm 137. No, God's wrath against evil is real and it's good and it's true. No evil remains unpunished. But that justice and punishment is his work not ours. And secondly, we must see again the wonder of God's grace towards us. What justice should mean for us, what it should look like for us to be repaid for what we have done. And then we rejoice again that Jesus has taken that punishment for us so that we might go free and so that we might look forward with certainty to one day going home to be with him. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the honesty with which it engages with our experience. We pray for those of us who are currently very aware of the experience of exile, the struggle with sin, with suffering, with the brokenness of this world. We pray that you might help us to draw alongside one another, to look up to the horizon and the promise of home. We thank you for sure and certain hope. We pray to you for those who are victims of violence and injustice. We ask that they might know you, the great bringer of justice, and find hope in your goodness and comfort in your love. We ask to you for each of us that you would give us a renewed awe and wonder at the grace you have lavished on us, that we stand free from condemnation as those in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your mercy and kindness towards us. Help us to live honestly and passionately in the light of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.